We all think we know Queen. Our biggest memory of them is when they took Live Aid by storm in what is now regarded as one of the great live performances. But I want to pull away what you think you know about them and reappraise a band I love. When four young guys, hungry to make their mark in music, infuse their energies to make some of the most adventurous albums ever recorded by a British group. Queen formed in London in 1971. John Deacon played bass, Roger Taylor the drums, Brian May lead guitar, and of course, Freddie Mercury was their voice. Mercury spent the bulk of his childhood in India, where he took piano lessons and played in a band called The Hectics. It was only when he was 17 that he moved to England. While studying art at Ealing College, Freddie would meet the other members of the group who had all been in numerous bands already. They were students. Deacon was studying electronics, Taylor was planning to be a dentist, while May was doing astronomy. The band Smile was their first collaboration, but after the departure of Tim Staffel, they recruited Deacon and started performing at Imperial College. Queen were now complete. They set about recording their debut. It was an album influenced by the heavy rock of the time. They were labelled the new Led Zeppelin. But the album showed versatility and even paid homage to the art rock of the day. Their follow-up, Queen 2, featured long, complex instrumentals. This was Queen doing prog rock. Yeah, yeah. It was jam-packed full of melody, so that people who liked your general pop could go, hey, I can really get into this. The album also spawned their first hit single, The Seven Seas of Rye. For their next recording, Brian May would create Brighton Rock, one of the best guitar solos in rock history. He built his own guitar, played with the sixpence. He used to use the Echoplex for his delay. You can tell it's him straight away. First couple of notes, oh, it's Brian. Sheer Heart Attack was a giant, radio-friendly leap forward and also gave the band their first taste of commercial success. The album fused a variety of different musical styles, from Caribbean to Ragtime to, of course, Heavy metal. I'm just. Another single, Killer Queen, reached number two in the British charts and also established them in America. Their fourth album, A Night at the Opera, was named after the Marx Brothers film. Freddie himself designed the artwork, and at the time, it was the most expensive album ever produced. But its highlight was to be a profound Mercury composition. Bohemian Rhapsody broke the rules of the pop song. It was in three distinctly different parts and there was no chorus. I see a little silhouette of a man. Scaramouche, Scaramouche, will you do the bandango? Delivering a visually exciting video to Top of the Pops guaranteed them a place on the program while the record stayed at number one. So the impact of that record was absolutely huge. Oh boy, nobody loves me. The most moving song on the album was one written for Mercury's long-term girlfriend, Mary Austin. He had been struggling with his sexuality for years and it began to disrupt their relationship. Love of my life, you've heard me. A Day at the Races contained some classics. Freddie got personal with a touch of gospel. But Tie Your Mother Down was sheer blood poetry. I remember at Radio 1, panic, because you couldn't put this on frequent rotation in daytime. It was just too strong. Tie your mother down, tie your mother down. They are the most improbable giant band. Sing it. We will, we will rock you. There's Fred demanding you pay attention. The sense of who he is, preposterous, and yet he imposed it on you. But it's the songs. Actually, it's the songs. But now is the time to acknowledge their early work for its complexity, energy, and beauty. Queen of Regal, they're British, and long may they reign. <laughs>